Hey, everybody. National Firearms Coalition here. Um, got Mike Vasquez, and we got Aaron Gardner, um, Michigan State Senate, uh, District 27 candidate. We're going to do a quick little interview. We're running a couple minutes late. We were waiting on another guy to show up. He will pop in uh, if he makes it. Um, we'll be asking some important questions important questions to the candidate regarding his campaign and regarding his opinion on certain hot topic and key issues uh, to try and get a gauge on what type of candidate he may be and to try to better educate uh, all of our viewers and anybody that may watch this video on whether or not they should uh, look more into him to vote. Um, Mike, go ahead and introduce yourself and then Aaron, you can follow up real quick and then we'll get right into the questions. Absolutely. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, I'm Michael Voss. I'm with the No Sound Bites Allowed, and I've been doing political commentary for about 15 years. I've done over 170 different interviews with candidates, elected officials, and other figures of note from the local to the presidential level of the United, presidential of the United States. And uh, I'm more going to be handling the general topics that may uh, address someone who is running for a state position. And I know uh, Zach, of course, National Firearms will be dealing with more of the gun and Second Amendment related issues for the most part. Um, Aaron, I'm looking forward to speaking with you today. And with that, let's uh, please introduce yourself to the audience. Yeah. My name is Aaron Gardner. I am running for the 27th district in the state Senate of Michigan, which covers everything from the northern border of Flushing Township to the southern border of Grand Blank Township, west into Lennon, and east into Burton and Mount Morris Town. Uh, it's a pretty large area, and an area of full of corruption that we've noticed over the last 60 years, uh, to include the Flint water crisis and a number of issues, and I'm tired of it, and that's why I'm running for office. Zach? Yep. Sorry, I had to find the mute button. <laughs> um, <laughs> That being said, everybody, i uh, like to thank everybody for tuning in. <clears throat> I know we had this scheduled for seven, um, but we were trying to wait until we could get our other guy in here. Um, so we will uh, hop right into it. Everybody, please make sure you share this video, uh, especially if you're in Michigan. Um, try to spread some love in Michigan uh, and better educate the voters in Michigan, um, especially if you live within that 27th district that Aaron Gardner is running for. Um, so I'll start right off with the number one question um, being asked by a lot of uh, pro-gun and pro-Second Amendment individuals is, how do you feel about furthering red flag laws, and how do you feel about red flag laws that exist already? Uh, number one, uh, shall not be infringed is, is a staple of the Second Amendment and, and shall remain that in the, in the Constitution. And red flag laws do nothing more than prohibit law-abiding citizens and Americans from protecting themselves. So all red flag laws in general are, by and large, bad and need to be, need to be removed from the books. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to see what the, what the Supreme Court's doing in New York. Um, and I'm happy to see the Supreme Court actually taking a stance on, on the states that are... Uh, restricting law-abiding citizens from carrying firearms. Good answer. Go ahead, Mike. All right. Uh, Aaron, I want to start off first with a question and in looking into your background. I've noticed that according to the Michigan Libertarian Party, I believe the Genesee County in particular, on November 23rd of 2021, it states that you're the vice chairman. In addition, in that same notation where you were speaking about the Second Amendment, um, they also note that you are the author of Snapshots of War. And according to Goodreads.com, um, you're also a writer for the Celestial Brotherhood, which is a Freemason uh, website. So my question would be, uh, many people don't know about these organizations. I want you to take a moment to please explain are you a member currently uh, of either of these organizations? And how does that affect, if at all, your, uh, if you were to be elected to the 27th District of Michigan as a state representative? Sure. 
Uh, one, the Libertarian Party is a political organization and political party uh, designed to elect libertarians or liberty-minded individuals to office. Uh, unfortunately, they are unable to accomplish that mission because of inbred fighting with each other, uh, and um, their 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 main goal is for less government. Uh, so, in that conservative mindset, less government is absolutely my my goal and my ambition uh so those principles and values still follow me but i am no longer a member of the libertarian party i resigned from the libertarian party when they couldn't stop their fighting and we had a huge issue here in michigan with our democratic governor and our democratic uh legislatures um and the corruption that was happening here in, in genesee county uh, i wanted to refocus and focus on what actually matters Next question. That's a great question about the, the Celestial Brotherhood and the Freemasons. Uh, I was a member of the Freemasons, and I haven't been for quite some time now uh, because, to be perfectly honest, I'm too busy. Uh, I have a family, and I have, I, have, I have my wife and my kids to be concerned about where the Freemasons was an organization that I was a member of uh, shortly after getting out of active duty. and. Uh, and finding that brotherhood and finding people that I can relate to and that understand me. Uh, and a lot of them are military at that. Mm -hmm. uh, so we had that relationship and we had that, that uh, understanding of who we are and we can have that fraternity. Um, but it doesn't affect me as a person or, uh, or my constituents or legislature uh, in my position on the legislature. Because bottom line is, is writing laws in the state or at any level requires my constituency and not me or my personal beliefs or my personal behaviors. It is about my constituency and what matters most to them. Okay. I thank you for that. Thank you for clarifying that because I know people may wonder. So thank you yeah. for giving us that answer. Yeah. All right. Um... So I guess another another big question uh, that's kind of a kind of a hot topic issue right now all across America, in light of all of these mass shootings, is uh, if elected, how would you propose or how would you make attempts to change school systems to further safe make school systems safer, make the public schools safer uh, for parents and for children. Um, how would you go about handling that? How do you feel like you should handle that? Well, I think the number one thing is to remove soft targets. I know that the I know that the left and the and the Democratic Party is going to hammer me hard on on saying that. But soft targets is exactly why we have these issues. When we have when we have locations where firearms are not able to be carried by law abiding citizens to protect themselves or protect the, those around them, you have these situations. So in a situation of a school. I am all for I'm not forcing anybody to, to carry if they don't choose to, but administrators who wish to carry or staff who wish to carry are a lot more effective to stopping a, an active shooter than waiting 40 to an hour, 40 minutes to an hour for a police officer to arrive in order to storm a building. Uh, we saw what happened in Texas and it's a devastating event. And I feel for those families. I can only imagine what they're going through. Um, and I, I feel for the families in Oxford of, and what they've gone through here in Michigan. And I think the best thing forward is to address the fact that soft targets are just sitting ducks. And if we don't have somebody there to stop them and intermediate, in intermediate between them, um, we will continue to see this suffering happen. So, uh, remove the soft targets, number one. Um, thank you for that. Yeah, thank you for that answer. Sorry. Um, I just keep muting myself because dogs barking in the background. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a really big issue. Um, and I, I think that uh, a lot of people would agree, especially on our side of the spectrum, um, that Acts like the GFSZA uh, and similar types of legislature are damaging, and it's a really uh, 
good thought to, you know, get behind having armed civilians in the education department that choose to do it and not forcing it on people. Um, but with that being said, thank you for that answer. Thank you for being elaborate and in depth. Uh, go ahead, Mike. Absolutely. Um, Aaron, thank you for uh, speaking about our schools and speaking up for parents there. But uh, I want to switch gears to talk about uh, the economy and specifically the Michigan economy. So 12% of Michigan currently gets food stamps, approximately 1.29 million people. Michigan is spending $119 billion as a state and $96 billion uh, they're taking in, $96 billion as tax revenue, leaving them a shortfall of $78 billion in the last year to date. Now, the limit for food stamps is $15,000 per person, according to Michigan records. State poverty is 13.7%, which is higher than the national average. How will you positively impact the people of the 27th District of Michigan, as well as the people of the state of Michigan, addressing food stamps and obviously the related issue of poverty? Uh, do you have any specific legislation that you have in mind, or what would you generally do? Yeah, so I do have specific legislation in mind, and that's to write legislation that encourages, we have to go to the root. And back to, the, I mean, I know we're moving up towards the economy, but they're related uh, between the education and the economy. Writing legislation that puts skill set, that put uh, trade skills, skill trade in the schools, um, that allows a school to teach our students specific trades so when they graduate high school, or even before they graduate high school, they can intern and work with businesses in the area, which would bring businesses to the area specifically for those needs because uh, we want businesses in Genesee County and across Michigan that are invested in our community. When they're invested, that means that they're gonna put their own money into the community, help remove a lot of the blight that we have here in Genesee County in Michigan, help remove a lot of the issues with our, uh, our economy, and it's lowering and, and it's the business is leaving because they're now coming in. And then on top of that, help those businesses that want to invest because without, without having them, we'll fail. We watch General Motors leave Genesee County. I live, in, I live not too far from Flint. And General Motors has just up and left us here, sitting here uh, in shambles. And it's because of our policies and because of our not taking care of our businesses and not taking care of our schools that we're in this situation. It used to be that when you graduate high school, you knew that you were gonna be working at General Motors. That was, just a, that was just a natural fact in life here in Genesee County, here in the Flint area. Today, you graduate high school, that's to say you actually graduate high school. When you graduate high school, the best option for you to join the military and get out of Michigan, which is a shame. We're sending good quality people out of Michigan to go fight for our nation, which is a noble cause, but it hurts our economy here too. Uh, so focusing back on that skilled trades and bringing those, those trades here to help them go out into the, into the economy uh, and actually be prepared to work. That's number one and, and write that legislation so that there is a merger and a relationship between the businesses and the schools and our community. I have one follow-up very quickly on that. I want to be very clear. According to the Obama administration, H-1B visas, they classify help desks. When people call in for help with their computers and such, they consider that a skilled, uh, a skilled job set. Are you speaking about jobs like that? Or are you speaking about electricians, carpenters, uh, machinists? Um, because today, there's not a lot of clarity between what we mean by skill set and skilled labor. Yeah, no, I don't, I don't consider, I mean, it is a skilled labor, I guess, because I, as an IT professional, I understand help desk and, and having to mm -hmm. help people out on the phone is a, is a skill. Mm -hmm. but, uh, a lot of that has been, has been, has been sent overseas, unfortunately. And so my main goal is to have machinists and businesses in Tennessee County that are making things, 
making money, not a service industry. Okay. Uh, thank you for clarifying that. That's, yeah. I, I think a lot of people get confused with that in the news. So thank you for that clarification. Yeah. Um, so something that we talk about with a lot of our following and something that a lot of people reflect on uh, is the history of us growing up as kids. Now, I didn't attend any schools in Michigan, so I don't know how Michigan has been. But I know when I was in school, um, we were taught firearm safety. Uh, we actually had like firearm classes where we had teachers that would bring in BB guns and cork guns. Um, and we also had programs for our hunter safety course provided through school. Um, so aside from feeling like we should allow firearms back in the schools, how do you feel about bringing that type of environment back to the education system where we're actually educating our youth on proper firearm safety uh, firearm procedures as far as storage and loading and unloading um, and basically training training kids in school uh, how to handle a firearm and how to be safe with and around a firearm. <clears throat> yeah. Um, look, I, I remember as a kid going downstairs into the basement with my grandpa and him pulling out all of his rifles. And I, I couldn't have been much older than seven or eight years old. And him showing me all of the things that all of the components of the rifle and how to hold it and how to where to point it in safe directions when when working with it so that when we went out to a store I didn't you know flag somebody with an unloaded weapon regardless because safety is safety is of the utmost importance when it comes to anything especially firearms and uh, so when he taught me that it went with me through the rest of my life all the way through my military career um, and here in Michigan, there's actually maybe only one or a few schools that they have um, rifle teams that actually go out and shoot, uh, shoot ski and shoot different competitions, which I think is awesome. I don't oppose it. I think that it has to depend on the school. And I, I think that it really ultimately, I am a, I am a constitutionalist and I am a, I am a firm believer in small government. And that shouldn't be on the state to make that determination. That should be on the municipal and the school district to make that determination. Good answer. I uh, can definitely have appreciation for that. Um, you know, I, I, I've always felt like that's a decision that should be left up to the local municipality and the school boards. Um, you know, not necessarily forcing rifle teams and stuff on people, but at least a at least proper education of firearms would be very beneficial because unfortunately right now, especially after COVID and students and kids being you know, stuck at home so much, um, we all know that the most exposure they get to firearms is video games and movies and TV. Um, so I can appreciate that. I thank you for the answer. Um, Mike, you can go ahead. Uh, I had to just double check this to make sure I was correct. In the in me, Michigan's 27th district, you see that about 5% of the population are military, ex military, the right retirees or individuals that served at least one uh, contract. In the state of Michigan, and Michigan happens to be the 11th largest state for military veterans overall. On May 10th of 2022, 150 Michigan National Guard members were sent to the Middle East by current Governor uh, Gretchen Whitmer. And this is being reported by the Detroit News. And this isn't for military service, which I believe your website may have, uh, may have inferred, but to build stuff. Yet, more importantly, you say that you believe it is bad for the governor to use the National Guard to reach out to overseas. Can you explain why you feel that way and what you might try to do um, to prevent that in the future based on your position? Yeah. Um, so I was a member of the, the National Guard here in Michigan that was deployed over to Iraq uh, with uh, Governor Granholm as the governor at the time. And um, we haven't, as a nation, we haven't declared war since prior to Vietnam, prior to Korea even. And 
uh, a lot of our conflicts are related to uh, corporate interests and and uh, money and, and retro and, and kind of with less less things to say about it. It's about money. Um, so I oppose that the Michigan governor can take our National Guard for political purposes and offer them to the president of the United States. Um, I think the best thing to do for that is uh, to write legislation that prevents that from happening unless Congress declares war, which puts that place, which puts that uh, responsibility on Congress and the president specifically to ask Congress to go to war, which is a huge deal and would, would cause a lot of people to be concerned about what's happening. Once we do that, then we can keep our, our military here, our Michigan National Guard here, and protect them from those types of hostile environments uh, and allow them to be properly trained here and ready for war in the event that they come. Okay. I, I thank you for that and for that clarification. I don't know if a lot of people realized that that's been going on and that Michigan was the 11th largest state with uh, veterans. So I thank you for answering that for all veterans out there. Yeah, one, one, thing, one thing about it is what I've noticed with the National Guard and specifically the National Guard is a lot of times we offer units up for conflict or for specific deployments overseas. And, and even if it's a peacetime deployment, um, just for one person to get a promotion, so it's all politics. It's all about money. And so for a colonel to be able to get general, for a full bird colonel to be able to get his one-star general, he needs a deployment under his belt. The best way to do it is to offer your unit to go, to, go overseas. And he might not necessarily, he or she may not actually be necessarily in harm's way, but those men and women and those young, uh, impressionable uh, teenagers who are just enlisting are the ones in harm's way, and we have to protect them because Ultimately, they are our economy, and they're going to be the employed right here in Michigan, and we can't do anything without them. I understand completely, especially having served in the military as well, so I do understand what your concerns are, and I thank you for answering that for me. Uh, Zach, go ahead. Yeah, sorry. I was uh, trying to figure out what the background noise was, but I think we've yeah, we were. figured out it's Mr. Marshall. Um, Aaron, by the way, when Mike Marshall comes back, uh, he is one of he is uh, the founding member of Liberty First Foundation. Um, he's a constitutionalist. Um, he had a couple of questions that he wanted to kind of throw out there. Um, so my next question uh, is not going to really be pertaining much to firearms. Uh, so I hope I don't catch you too much off guard. Um, my next question is: is uh, you? are formerly a libertarian member. Um, we've had discussions about this uh, pre-interview, um, but I would like you to tell the viewers and anybody who may watch this video, um, what made you really decide to leave the libertarian party and join the Republican party? And what are your thoughts as far as, you know, if you, if you become elected, um, I'm sure people are going to want to be able to uh, you know, have faith that you're going to remain in that conservative Republican, you know, uh, persona. Um, so just kind of solidify a little bit your experience with it, um, why you left it, uh, and what can make people have faith in the fact that you are, in fact, a constitutional originalist of the Republican Party. Yeah. Um, well, when I get elected... There's, I don't think there's an if about it. When I get elected, uh, you will not have to worry about me leaving the party or becoming like Justin Amash did when he was in, uh, in D.C. Because the fact is, a political party's job is to get people elected for uh, a like-minded response with a group of people. And the Libertarian Party has failed to do that time and time again. As a conservative, I was on the conservative side of that party. Uh, I've had a lot of arguments and fights with the liberal side of that party, that liberal side of the liberal wing of the Libertarian Party. Mm -hmm. And 
Um, and those fights have never stopped and they never ceased and they can't actually function as a political party. It's unfortunate because I think that uh, our country could do really well with, with multiple parties, but when the party can't stop fighting, uh, you're going to have nothing more than infighting and you can't focus on that. I mentioned earlier about um, the state of Michigan. The state of Michigan is, is notoriously blue. Um, we've had a huge, I mean, we had a lot of uh, union members who have voted Democrat for a time, for a long time. And um, with the, the notorious, what's that? I said the automotive industry in Michigan is huge. Yes. So with, with that, the notorious blue state that we've been, uh, we've given up a lot of different liberties and a lot of different freedoms. That even even the constitutionalists can't can't try to get back yet. Even the the, the strongest libertarian, the, even Justin Amash, cannot fight for those yet within the Libertarian Party. The only way that we can do it is if we were to come together as a whole and fight for it. So I am fighting for on a on the Republican side. Um, I am much more of a Republican than I am uh, a Libertarian, and and I, I think the only the reason why I was a part of the Libertarian Party in the in the beginning was because I was tired of being duped by both parties. I was a soldier for 14 years in the United States Army, and I have gone over to Iraq under under Bush, and I fought under Obama. I went to UAE under Obama to watch over Iran, and it seemed to be the same cyclical cycle. Of, of being a pawn in the United States military to fight for money, to fight for corporate greed and, and, and justice. When in all reality, I signed up to defend the Constitution of the United States of America against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Well, when I joined the Libertarian Party, I was meaning to keep my oath by that. And by joining the Republican Party, I am refocusing to keep my oath by that and to fight against the progressive liberals that we have here in the state. Of America. Um. Well said. I thank you for the answer. And uh, hopefully it wasn't too off guard. I just wanted you to kind of touch base on that for the viewers. Because you did mention it in the beginning of the video, but you didn't really go into detail on what would happen if you were to be elected. Um, love the enthusiasm, by the way, when I am elected. Um, that's a good thing to have. Uh, Mike, Mike Bass, I guess you can go ahead with your next question. Not, sh not so sure what's going on with Mr. Marshall. Hopefully he gets to chime in. Yeah, um, it may be a temporary issue. I think he was working on the background noise. Uh, before I ask the question, I do want to mention to everyone, I have not spoken to Aaron beforehand, nor do, to my knowledge has Mike Marshall. So he has no idea what questions we're asking. I know that Zach has spoken uh, to Aaron, um, get everything prepared today, but no questions were provided to Aaron before this meeting. So these are all surprises to him. Uh, with that being said, I want to also mention taking another direction. Besides the economy, I think the most important thing that is on the national mindset, everyone is concerned about crime. Um, there's been no doubt and no question in all media it is uh, apparent that crime has been increasing. Part of that has been because of well, policies such as def defunding the police. In the 27th district, which includes Flint, Michigan, we've seen many elected politicians, and of course at the state level as well with the governor, that they have been trying to defund the police. And yet we see that Flint, Michigan, as a prime example, exceeds the national average on crime statistics up to 2019, which are available at this time before the 2020 riots and the subsequent problems there. Um, and this is according to citydata.com. How do you plan that to address the concerns of crime, both in Flint, Michigan, throughout the 27th district of Michigan and the state? Yeah. Um, Flint, Michigan has had the has had a huge crime wave in Michigan, especially. And um, it's, 
it's more in part because there aren't enough police officers on the street in Flint, Michigan. When police officers are taking taking reports over the phone about crimes and not actually seeing the victims in, in hand, uh, that's what's causing this. Is, is it's a, there's no repercussions for for being a criminal, and and police officer with the police officers being in a minimum capacity, especially here in Flint and, and across Michigan, uh, we have to find ways to increase our force. And I think the best way to increase our force is one to reel back all of that state funding and uh, how the state has appropriated the funds to the police department. Give the money back to the municipals, give the money back to the police departments so that the police departments can afford their own benefits so the police officers can make it happen for their own police officers. Give them a reason to want to serve their, their community. And then once they're once we have more police officers who are willing to put their life on the line and thank god they will put them visible in the community have them playing basketball with the with the youth in the community have them driving up and down the streets in the community there should be no reason why a person shouldn't be able to walk out their door and know that they're safe because they don't because they see a police every person should be able to see to be able to walk down the street and know that they're safe. Not because the police officers are hiding or because there's not enough police officers in the community, because there is enough police and enough uh, community support around those police. Okay. I, I thank you for dealing with it. Again, touchstone question throughout the nation in every community. And I thank you for your answer on that. Uh, Mike. I'm gonna. Go ahead and let Mr. Marshall ask a couple of questions um, since we've only got about 15 minutes left here. Or... I do apologize for running late and some technical difficulties on my end. That's all right. Um, I am actually going to segue off of uh, Mr. Vasquez's um, question to you and continue on the theme of law enforcement. Particularly... We see a lot of expansion of law enforcement powers in a lot of areas. Okay. Many of them cannot be constitutionally justified. What actions are you going to take to stop this overreach of governmental authority? Yeah. Uh, I think that was. I think that was a big issue, and I think that returning the returning the, the funding back to the municipals to for them to allow their own benefits will help because that removes the state and the federal government from dictating what those police officers are going to be doing in that community. Uh, that actually puts it on the, on the city and the municipals. That's uh, I think that's important to do, and I think that's important to know. Um, the federalization and the statewide uh, encroachment of our police force and using our police force against the constituents and against the, the people is abhorrently wrong and it needs to be changed. And, and I think that's probably the best thing. There's the right legislation that returns the money back to the municipals and puts the responsibility back on the city. Okay, I do. I do agree that we do need to get the federal and state governments out of municipal um, policing. Um, but there's more to it than just that. Okay, I'm talking about uh, stop and frisk. Okay, when officers um, make up excuses to force a search in a vehicle. By using stuff like, well, is that marijuana I smell? Is that shake that I see on the floor? Okay, stuff like that. How are you going to hold these officers who took the same oath as you and I did when we served in the military, same as Michael Vasquez did? How are you going to hold them accountable to upholding their oath and not exceeding the powers or the limits that are established by? the city charters, the state constitution, and the federal constitution. Hmm. 
That's a that's a very tough question because of like stop and frisk. It's one I, I think stop and frisk has been determined that it is unconstitutional. Uh, that situation in New York. Uh, no, Terry stops are still Terry allowed. Stops are, Terry stops are still. I I I personally believe that they are unconstitutional, and I I agree with you on that. The court, I guess, to stop them on a state level as a state legislature, um, would be to to write accountability and um and transparency laws that affect the the municipals that are that are governing these police bodies. Uh, so in the event of a situation like that, when it's reported, it is reported to a uh, third party system, not through the police department that they were just as assaulted through or uh, th that they were just frisked through um, and, and have that third party investigate and we can bring it to light. Uh, I think, that is a that is a bigger problem that will take a lot of work to a, account for because individuals the individual police officer itself is the ultimate issue. I don't necessarily think it's necessarily a department issue. I think it's an individual, and departments should uh, should be more involved with their individual officers more to understand where they are. Well, would you be for removing qualified immunity? Qualified immunity. Yes, I would. I, and I will, I will firmly state that I would be for removing qualified immunity. Because qualified immunity just creates an environment for those types of events happen. Okay. I thank you for your answer. Um, I, and that is, again, We've got both sides of the issue here, where we have an, a problem with increased crime rates, which we still need to deal with, but we also have a problem with out-of-control cops, which I think is also amplifying a lot of these problems that we're seeing as well. Yeah, I, I, I would like to, I like to further on that and, and say that, you know, like I mentioned, it's an individual police officer who is doing that. Um, and if we were to hold an individual police officer for responsible for it, and instead of one qualified immunity, all it does when a police officer files with qualified immunity and, and is is uh, let go with a slap on the wrist, those funds that they pay the victim for being violated, those funds are coming from the taxpayers' dollars anyway. Right. And and that's unfortunate because really you're just paying for it. You're paying for it twice. Not mm -hmm. only as, as a victim, but as a as a taxpayer. You're paying for your own for being a victim of a crime. Uh so I I would I would tend to agree and I absolutely think that qualified immunity should be uh should should be taken a look at one hundred percent. Great answer. Thank you. Thank you for that answer. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, because I also understand that um, qualified community, there is some instances where qualified community is needed, but a good majority of the time when it's used, it shouldn't. Um, yeah. I okay, think and that's just my personal opinion. I think there is, a, I, I do agree. I think that there's a, uh, I think there's a there. There should be an insurance that the police officer has for themselves, as an individual, in the event of that, so that they can actually help take care of that. Um, and it it would put the responsibility on the police officer yet again to ensure that they are not violating somebody else's right by the color of the law, and uh, for those situations where uh, those. Those, I I think they're few and far in between where they are actually uh, justified. I think we we should we should sit down as as a legislature and as constituents. We should all sit down together and find a equal balance on how we can address that. Okay, I would actually like to talk to you um, offline on this. Um, yeah. 
I'm not a political candidate, um, but I do have some suggestions that I would love to get with you um, offline. Absolutely. About. This isn't about me. It's about you and about you, your position. So um, on that, we have a lot of our community that are being funded um, outside of the constitutional authority of the federal government and of the state government. How are you going to start proposing on reducing that and changing that and getting it so that our communities are more self-reliant instead of being uh, relied upon state and federal government? Yeah. Um, well, we have to go through the budgets at every level, all the local levels and, and the state level and find where, where that money's going. Number one, uh, here in, here in Genesee County specifically, we have just thrown money at every problem that we could and it doesn't fix any issue because one money doesn't necessarily fix the issue, uh, that mismanagement has caused. So we have to we have to figure out that budget and sitting down line by line going through that budget is is an absolute must and that way when flint michigan has an eight million dollar project that they have to work on it doesn't come from our funds it doesn't come from federal dollars it doesn't come from state tax dollars it comes from the tax dollars of the city um and they can, me personally, I am not a tax person. I don't like taxes. I think taxes uh, actually hurt the citizens more. But I understand that there's a, a need for uh, to pay for certain things within our community. But putting it down at the local level and making them responsible and removing the state 100% away from it. Uh, the writing legislation that removes the state from the, from the city's finance okay thank you for that answer and i have to agree with you i'm not much for taxes however i do believe that taxation taxes are our actual first form of redress of grievances I agree. however the way current tax codes are written you absolutely have no way means of exercising that form of redress of course, because they'll come arrest you when you don't pay your taxes for your exactly, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, but that's again, that's um, an, another thing. So, um, so I'm gonna go ahead and turn it back to Zach or Michael, um, and then we'll go from there. Michael, Michael's been sitting here laughing at something. I'm, I'm dying to know, dying to know what's got him so happy. No, just watch, watching Mike swoop him so he can get all the questions he wanted. He's making up all the missed time, so it's kind of cool. <laughs> yeah. oh, oh, got more. <laughs> if nobody, uh, if nobody has any other serious questions to ask, I think I do. Go ahead, Go ahead Mr. Smith. And, and I think it should be uh, addressed because you mentioned it on your website. Um, and I do invite people to go to your website, which is the Gardner for state senate that's with a d gardener for state senate.com where they'll be able to see some other information this is a question um, that i saw on there now obviously you supported h uh, this is michigan bill house bill hb 4471 yes which was uh, put through and died in committee on march 23rd of 2021 this is in reference to the pandemic, so I realize we're limited due to censors on how we can answer. But I want to be very clear because you say in there that you voluntarily walked away from a job. Yes. Um, this was at a time where a lot of states were looking at mandatory requirements for vaccinations and other pandemic-related uh, effects. I want to clarify when you say voluntarily walked away, was it because of a regulation of Michigan? And how do you feel about mandates of any sort from the government 
to the people of Michigan? It was a it was a company policy because of state they were they were receiving state money to uh, help enforce a mandate, and a lot of it was coming from the from the it was a pre preemptive strike on what Biden was going to do with OSHA. Uh, I walked away because they told me. My 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 favorite thing is that being being a veteran, the military just sticks you with everything they can, and then tells you to go off and fight wars. Disease and number one and two, yes. So, I uh, when I have the option to decide whether I'm going to put something inside my body, I'm going to make that my option and my choice. And my company told me that I have to understand the predicament I was putting them in and not the predicament they were putting myself or my family. And number one, myself and my family are the, are the first and foremost spot after God where I hold responsibility, and I, I will do everything I can to protect them. I walked away from my job because of that. I walked away from my job because of principle and value. And uh, I'm a better man for it. It's, it's actually got me to where I am today uh, with my current position or my current job um, and and running for office and really firing me up to to really oppose it. Now, 4471, uh, I, am, I am opposed to mandates in general. The government should not be telling the people what they can and cannot do with themselves. Um, I think Amen to that. I think I think mandates are a tool that the government uses to uh, to put us to put us into line, and that's inappropriate because we are not, as the people, we are not to be put in line. The government is supposed to be put in line, and that's my job, and that's what I will be doing as a state legislature is to put the government back in line because we answer to the people and the people only. I, I want to thank you for that, and I thank you for clarifying because. There are some politicians that use word games. I volunteer to do this or that when there may be something else. So I thank you for making that crystal clear for the public to know exactly where you stood and how you stood on this very sensitive issue. So I do uh, thank you for that. I, I know we're crunched for time. I could ask many other questions. I look forward in the future to be able to do so. But uh, that's everything I've got at the moment. Um. That being said, uh, I know we were a little late getting started out, everybody. Um, we did get quite a few very important questions out of the way that uh, mm -hmm. would entice a lot of people to really make an educated voting decision and uh, to take a look at your website, your campaign website, which is GardnerForStateSenate.com. Um, also has a Facebook page uh, for his campaign that I will link in the comments once we're offline here. Um, I'd love to speak with you off camera and possibly set up another day where we have a little more time um, to talk some more. Uh, but uh, as of tonight, um, these guys also have their Liberty First round table that they're going to be sitting in on here in about eight minutes. So we do have to go ahead and wrap this up. Um, I will give you a call here in a little while uh, to see if we can make another date and another appointment to sit down and maybe have another half hour or another 40 minutes or something and come forward with a little bit more questions. Um, on that note, you can go ahead and, uh, you know, say goodbye. And I appreciate you coming on the show. I appreciate your time. I appreciate all of your answers for all of these questions. And as always, I appreciate Mr. Mike Vasquez um, from No Sound Bites Electric and Mike Marshall from Liberty First Foundation. Um, Aaron, if you want to go ahead and say something real quick, closing out. Yeah. Uh, first, I want to I want to thank you guys for having me on, and I appreciate I appreciate all the questions, even the tough ones, Mike. I I know that they're. Uh, I want to I want to make sure everything is clear as possible because, uh, as you said, that some politicians tend to be uh, very uh selective on their wording and how they use their wording and i want to be as clear as possible because i am not your everyday politician i'm not a politician at all 
I am a father. I am a husband. I am a veteran. And I'm here to fight for Genesee County. I'm going to keep fighting for Genesee County. Win or lose, I, I want to win, and I will be winning. I know I will win. But when I'm in Lansing, I will continue to fight uh, through it all. I'm not going to be just the typical guy who goes off to Lansing or D.C. and never comes home because this is my home. All of my constituents will see me. They will, uh, I'll be sharing a grocery store with them every day. Uh, so I want them to know that I'm just like them. I bounced around this county for, well, all of my childhood. I bounced around this county and went to multiple schools in this county and graduated from this county before I left for the Army. And I'm, I'm done fighting. I'm, I'm done fighting those wars overseas. I'm here to fight this war here. I appreciate you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You guys have a good night. And uh, I look forward to doing this again. I will uh, get with you here in a little while. And we will set up another day for a little bit more time. Sounds good, Zach. You guys have a good night.